Denmark Design Museum has kept the finest collection of uh, Japanese sword ornament, tsuba or brim, for many years. The more you will see them and the more you get to know the history of tsuba, the more fascinated you will be. At the end of the day, of course, tsuba will enrich already very good relations between the Kingdom of Denmark and Japan. So I hope you will enjoy the video and someday you will come and see them in person. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador, for these uh, very kind and generous words. And uh, on behalf of Design Museum Denmark, I'm very, very happy to have this uh, unique opportunity to uh, showcase the wonderful collection of uh, sword guards and sword fittings, uh, since we are so privileged to, uh, to house such a collection here in Denmark. And I think uh, your words about uh, mutual uh, relationship and cultural exchange is uh, very important because uh, there's a close kinship between the two countries and has been that for many, many years. And uh, my heart, uh, in many ways, also belongs to Japan. So uh, it's really an honor to be part of this uh, presentation. Thank you very much. This is a really great uh, pleasure to uh, be able to share this uh, unique treasure with you. Uh, one of the highlights from our collection, uh, it's the sword guards and fittings, and uh, it's really a world of its own. In uh, this wonderful collection, we see the combination of tradition, a uh, long, vivid, and very proud tradition of the Japanese armors and sword fittings uh, through centuries, many, many centuries, combined with the beauty of the design of these exquisite uh, sword fittings. Um, actually, we go back to 13th century, so it's quite a while, but I will start in our nearest past for almost 40 years ago in uh, 1983. This wonderful publication uh, was published by a Japanese publishing house. And it is actually the collection in the book format. Uh, here we see all of the sword fittings. It's about a little more than 1,700. Uh, it's 1,000 of uh, the tsubas and uh, 700 different kinds of fittings for the sword. Uh, in this wonderful publication, Nobu Ugasabara, who is representing the National Museum of Tokyo. He uh, has a critical uh, commentary in the beginning, and he is also the one who describes not all of the, the sword fittings, but some of them in detail. And he says that this collection housed at our museum is one of the finest collections of its kind anywhere in the world, which is really extraordinary. At the same time, he also says, and uh, I quote, that uh, he has been fascinating with the fact that this wonderful collection was actually collected by a Danish medical doctor more than 100 years ago. In many ways, it's quite fascinating that a Danish medical doctor, who, by the way, never had the opportunity to visit uh, Japan himself, he was almost obsessed with Japanese art and especially the sword fittings. Um, so he has uh, been doing this classification and organization of the whole collection according to the principles of the uh, Hugo Halberstadt. So this points to three interesting uh, aspects, uh, which I will uh, expand a bit in the following. The first thing is the collection itself, with a few words on the sword fittings, and then it's uh, the biography, you can say, or the person, Hugo Halberstadt himself. And then finally, a few words about the cultural exchange between the countries of uh, Japan and Denmark. Um, you can ask yourself, why do we hold such a rich, and extraordinary treasure in Denmark? Uh, 
a small country quite far from Japan. And it has to do with a general uh, movement in uh, the Western world in the late uh, 19th century, more precise from uh, 1868, uh, when we had the Meiji Restoration in uh, Japan, and Japan opened to the world. That was the start of a literally Japan craze or Japanomania, where the Western artists and uh, designers, they were obsessed with uh, everything from Japan because it had this very high level of craftsmanship and uh, an aesthetic and a beauty which was uh, second to, to none. And it was a completely unknown field that was suddenly made accessible. So when this fascination of Japan and everything from Japan uh, started, there were especially two uh, central uh, areas where the interest directed. And one was uh, the armors, the fittings, the sword fittings, and the other was the woodblock printing. So that uh, aroused the, the greatest interest. At the same time where you witnessed this process, we have uh, the emergence of a completely new uh, kind of museums uh, in the Western world, the so-called museums for decorative art, which is not art museum in themselves, but uh, museums collecting things, work of art uh, uh, related to uh, human life and uh, interior decoration and uh, the um, conceptualizing of, of space in many different ways. And these museums, they emerge first in London in 1851, and then it sort of spread through Europe, and it also came to Denmark, where this museum was established as the Danske Kunstindustri Museum, the Danish Museum of uh, Decorative Art, in 1890. And um, it's very interesting to see that uh, at the same time as these museums were established, they started by approaching Japan and Japanese art as one of the essential elements in the collections. And it was the same in, uh, in Denmark here in Copenhagen. You can ask yourself, what is a collection? Uh, a collection can be many things. And in this case, we see different kinds of collections uh, um, uh, at the agenda because uh, as one can imagine, a collection is essential for a museum. You can call it even the raison d'etre of a museum, because if you do not have a collection, you do not have a museum. But then at the same time, there was a lot of uh, private collectors privileged uh, when it came to economic means or when it came to interest and knowledge about uh, fine arts and uh, applied art. So there was this kind of... Um, mutual interest from private collectors and from museums directed in the, in the, in the Japanomania um, week. So um, here we have the fine collection from uh, Hugo van Halberstadt, who was uh, the, the Danish medical doctor, but before we have the collection from uh, Halberstadt, or at the same time as this collection was established, we have a fine museum collection from the first uh, director of uh, what we call today Design Museum Denmark, but was the Museum for Decorative Art. The museum was established in 1890, and uh, just two years before, we had a huge exhibition here in Copenhagen. It was called the Nordic Exhibition of Industry, Archi Agriculture, Art and Craft. And it was not a world exhibition as we know them when it comprises all of the countries in the world, but it was a Nordic exhibition with a strong international focus. And that was the first time when uh, Japanese uh, art and craft were uh, introduced in Denmark. And a lot of collectors uh, were very enthusiastic about this uh, exhibition. And some of the elements were exactly the sword fittings, which were really um, in focus. 
So we have to remember that it, this exhibition was just held a few years before the museum was established. And then the first director for the museum, uh, called Pietro Kron, who was, by the way, an artist himself and were the artistic director of the Royal Theatre and at one of our uh, very famous porcelain uh, factories, Bing and Grøndal. Uh, he was appointed the first director and uh, he uh, made a huge effort in, um, in starting a first class uh, collection also uh, with the Japanese and East Asian uh, art. And he had uh, very good connections to the European museums and to uh, international collectors from uh, Europe. So he really um, collected quite a lot of Tsubas himself. And that was the first collection of Tsubas in the museum. At that time, he met Halberstadt, who was uh, a fairly young man. We can say he was in his 30s. And uh, he had the same interest. And he started to uh, register and to describe the museum collection. So that was his uh, introduction to uh, the, the sword fittings. And actually, he was a very knowledgeable man, so he was the one who could really uh, uh, put the collection in perspective together with a, a Japanese gentleman from uh, Hamburg in uh, northern Germany who was uh, an expert at our sister museum, the Museum für Kunst und Gewerbe in uh, Hamburg. Let me start with a brief introduction to Hugo Halberstadt, uh, the amazing uh, person who uh, donated this wonderful collection to the museum. Um, he was born in uh, 1867 uh, and he was, uh, he was uh, trained as a medical doctor, but uh, at the same time he was also a scholarly person and he uh, really had a amazing knowledge about uh, Japanese uh, art and craft. And uh, he started as a relatively young man when he was, uh, it was in 1895, by collecting these uh, sword fittings. And uh, it's, it's quite interesting that he had never visited Japan himself, and he had to, uh, to collect uh, with the help of others. So he, uh, he really had a lot of uh, contacts from uh, auction houses in uh, Europe and uh, art dealers. And he was known uh, at that time as uh, one of the most outstanding collectors. And uh, apparently he was uh, with unlimited means. So it was not a question of uh, the prices of these supas, which also makes it a wonderful collection. He started to collect, he did it uh, gradually. I know he visited uh, libraries, not just here in, uh, in uh, Denmark, but all over Europe. And he uh, read a lot about uh, Japanese uh, armor, sword fittings, and other kinds of, uh, of art. And uh, he gradually uh, built his own library, which was also uh, quite unique. A lot of books, publications about uh, these uh, topics. And uh, in the end, he also donated all the, the books to uh, our museum library. So between 1895 and uh, the late 1930s, he uh, collected all these wonderful tsubas. He described them himself. And uh, I'm going to share with you what uh, his handwritten manuscripts look, looks like because we have them in our archives. And it's, uh, it's also fascinating to see how he meticulously has been writing about all the details, the uh, materials, uh, the different kinds of uh, craft traditions and the different uh, uh, masters who uh, actually uh, created them. Hugo Halberstadt, besides of uh, describing and uh, making catalogues of his own collection, he also did an immense job on the Design Museum collection, where he was uh, a very, very close uh, collaborator and uh, partner to the museum director. And actually, he uh, worked closely together with three different directors because it took quite a span of time. And uh, then... 
It happened in, uh, in the late 1930s, uh, when the Second World War was approaching. Uh, he became um, quite, uh, he, since he had a Jewish background, he was uh, quite disturbed by the condition. At that time, uh, Denmark was uh, occupied by Germany. So he decided to uh, give his uh, Tupac collection to the museum. In the first place, he wanted the museum to take care of it while he was uh, in exile in Sweden uh, during the World War. But uh, at the same time, when he, uh, he was going to leave uh, Denmark, he made a, a letter of donation. So it was actually a huge, huge gift to the museum. The museum... Um, received this gift in 1940 and uh, were obliged to uh, keep the Tsubas safe. And uh, at any time, it says in the letter of uh, donation, at any time Halberstadt wanted to uh, uh, have his uh, collection or to see it, uh, he should be, uh, it should be uh, granted that he was, uh, could be close to the collection at any time. But then he uh, left uh, Denmark in uh, 1943, flew to uh, Sweden, and uh, unfortunately he died there in 1945, actually only a couple of months before uh, uh, the Germans were defeated and uh, Denmark was uh, free again. So uh, this wonderful collection were donated to the museum and it became part of our... Uh, of our larger museum collection. So it's a really a very dramatic um, story connected to the, to the, to the whole Halberstadt uh, collection. So uh, the museum uh, agreed to uh, accommodate the collection in uh, a superb uh, cabinet made by one of the, designed by one of the finest uh, furniture designer in Denmark, Kåre Klint, and uh, I executed by one of the finest uh, cabinet maker in Copenhagen, Ud Rasmussen. And uh, this wonderful cabinet, which comprises of uh, six different cabinets. Uh, behind me, we only have three of them, but there are six altogether. And uh, it's uh, um, this chest with drawers where we uh, exhibit uh, the tsubas and the fittings as part of a study collection, so they are all together in the cabinets, all 1719 uh, objects from the collection. And uh, they were arranged according to uh, Halberstadt's uh, own descriptions, and uh, a famous uh, Danish textile designer did the wonderful weaving of uh, colored textile, which was in the bottom of uh, the drawers, where a subtle uh, color code, you can say, uh, describe what kind of a time period and what kind of masters uh, they refer to the Tsubas. But when you look at it, if you're not familiar with the, these codes, and you can just enjoy all the Tsubas and uh, enjoy the variety and the richdom of uh, different kinds of ornaments, different kinds of motifs, and as we know from uh, a lot of other uh, Japanese art, the motifs, they are from different kinds of uh, motive groups, you can say. A lot comes from the natural world. Different come from uh, persons or persons and uh, deities with reference to historical myth and um, and stories. So uh, there's a rich, there's really an abundance of uh, references in this uh, treasure behind me here. Here we have uh, the Japanese sword, and this is meant for a demonstration so that you can see what elements it consists of. We have the so called sword guard, the brim or in Japanese, the tsuba, which is here. Uh, the tsuba protects the hands from sliding over uh, the sword. Uh, there are different elements uh, connected to the tsuba, which is also part of the collections, because uh, it's possible to have a small dagger on one side and a small needle on the other side, which is also part of uh, the weapon. 
Um, it's also important to know that uh, the masters or the craftsmen who crafted the sword is completely different people from the ones who did the ornaments, uh, like the tsubas. It was two different professions and it uh, demanded different kinds of skills. So here we have the collection which consists of 719 items. More than 1,000 are the tsubas. And they are arranged and organized in all these drawers, which is like a study collection where you can see and examine them. It has been said about the Halberstadt collection that it is a very fine collection because the tsubas and the, the fittings, they represent uh, pieces of art which is uh, also more simple in their expression and more original, you can even say, more true to the core of the, the, the weapon, the art of weapons, because uh, as I gradually aroused a larger interest in these Japanese items, there were also set up a production where sword fittings and tubas were made for the market and not for the warrior. And in this case, we have some very fine examples, which means that some of them, even though they are so exquisite, they really doesn't look like something special uh, because they are, I wouldn't say rustique, but uh, rather rustique. And this also uh, uh, has to do with the material because uh, the basic material, when it comes to the tsubas, it's iron. And then we have different kinds of uh, other kinds of metal inlaid or carved out, and it could be gold, it could be uh, copper, it could be uh, silver. And when it comes to these uh, more precious metals, of course, it has to be a kind of alloy because uh, it's too soft itself to be part of the, uh, rather, it should, you, it should be durable when it comes to a weapon. So there are uh, quite a variety in the, in the uh, in the way they are, they are designed and executed. Let me show you a few examples of the rich variety we have in the collection and in the tsubas. Um, a lot of the tsubas have what we call the open work design, which is, this is a very good example of. Here we have a tsuba where we have a very uh, strict, very uh, geometric uh, ornament. It's pure ornamental. It's almost abstract, you can say. And it's like a lot of threads crisscrossing this uh, circular form. Another fine example of this uh, open work design could be this tsuba. Here we see a motif which is apparently almost abstract, but at the same time it has clear natural references because it's, uh, um, it's uh, an example of the wave, which is a very uh, essential and uh, used motive in the Japanese art. This is uh, also a wonderful tsuba and uh, one of my personal favorites among other personal favorites. Also because we see so many different uh, elements of technique and uh, motifs here. So we have, uh, also, we have the relief uh, elements. It's uh, really three-dimensional. We have the different kinds of sizzle work and uh, carving uh, in this fine tsuba. Uh, it has a very uh, clear motif because we have the crane, which is uh, one of the favorite um, animals or birds in the, the Japanese uh, tradition. And we have the wave, we have like the sea here. And this is also a good example to show you that a tsuba actually have two sides. Some of the tsubas do not have two sides, or of course they have two sides, but it's not something which has uh, a difference. But here you see on the, the front, we have the crane, we even have the crane which is covered by inlaid gold. And then if we turn it around, we see the lower part of the crane with the feet also uh, with the gold. 
and uh, continuing with the wave and the sea below. I think we should conclude this uh, Halberstadt uh, collection demonstration by showing some really fine examples of uh, the techniques with the inlaid uh, gold in the tubas. So we here have uh, an example of the open work design and we have uh, the recognizable uh, motif because this is fans, also very um, well known as a specific uh, Japanese element in the, we know in, in the Western countries. So it's the fan which itself is a category of art, uh, a decorative art. And uh, you can see here all the tiny, tiny details because within every single fan we have this wonderful uh, chisel work where you see so many details. You get almost so humble when you see and recognize this, uh, um, this level of craftsmanship, which is extraordinary. And at the same time here, we have the, the two-sided uh, tuba. And uh, we have also uh, other examples here where you can, uh, for instance, see this uh, tuba, where you see it's, uh, it's, like a, it's like a landscape, it's like a complete narrative where you see the bridge and you see the, the houses, you see uh, different sorts of trees and uh, everything with wonderful uh, gold uh, technique and so fine details. So it's... Um, you really understand how it has had this fascination for people from the Western world because it was like a glimpse into the world of Japan, something which had previously been completely unknown to, to people from the West. So this is really a lovely piece as well. Now we have moved from uh, the exhibition hall to our library, and uh, the library hosts the archives as well. And the first thing I want to share with you is uh, Hugo Halperstadt's uh, personal description of uh, the Tsuba collection in his own handwriting. So it comprises of uh, eight volumes in handwriting, which was uh, later on typed and then it was part of the publications that we saw in the beginning uh, from, 18, from 1983. So here we have uh, two boxes, which is uh, the home for Halberstadt manuscripts. And here we have uh, 35 different booklets written by Halberstadt. And uh, i just show you here. This is a uh, very interesting notebooks, you can say. It's uh, notebooks which is uh, when he had read a book about uh, Japanese art, he uh, takes his uh, notes in handwriting. He makes a resume of the book and it could also be a discussion he had had, which has been uh, referred or it has been something which is, it could be a book about uh, the art of armor from Japan. So you can say this was his, uh, part of his resource for knowledge about uh, Japanese uh, conditions. Um, they all, they're all different. Some of them are the same blue, but uh, there's a variety. And even you have here like uh, a manuscript, which is a, uh, Lebenslauf der Natsuo Kano, which is uh, the story of the life of this uh, Japanese uh, master. A lot of his notes are actually in uh, German, and that was not because he was uh, from Germany, but because uh, German was a uh, preferred language when it came to literature about this uh, specific area. Uh, to give you an example of the content of these uh, notebooks or manuscripts, I have found the volume number eight, this small little one, which is from Ausstellung Alter Ostasiatischer Kunst. 
uh, from an, uh, which means it's from an exhibition on uh, East Asian art, and it's from uh, the Königliche Akademie der Kunste in Berlin, also the Royal Academy of Art in Berlin, from 1912. And there you can see how he has been doing all his recordings of uh, the exhibition, even including small uh, drawings of the Tsubas. And another example could be notebook or volume number 31, which is a kurze Erläuterung der Kriegswaffen von Kinoshita Yushitoshi from 1856, which means that this is a book written in the middle of the 19th century about a specific uh, master of uh, uh, warrior weapons. And here you can see how he actually uh, quite detailed described with the um, drawings, the images, and also adding the Japanese letters and his old handwriting all over. So this is really a, a, a very authentic piece of uh, this remarkable person, Hugo Halberstadt. This is the first part of the fine super collection from the museum, which was collected by the first director, Pietro Krohn, uh, in the years between 19, uh, 1890 and 1905, where he sadly passed away. And uh, it was not a donation like the Halberstadt with its own beautiful cabinet as uh, the Halberstadt collection is housed in. So here we have a more modest version with all the Zubas in a fine system of small envelopes. And uh, that was actually one of the first uh, very important uh, tasks that the Halberstadt fulfilled for the museum because he made this wonderful also handwritten catalogue in the years 1907, 1908. The Danske Kunstindustrimuseum's Japanske Sværprydelser Sort Fittings uh, a describing and enlightening catalogue by Hugo, ha Hugo Halberstadt, 1908. And what we find here is his very own descriptions of everything. All the almost 300 uh, tsubas and sword fittings collected by the museum. This was later on uh, typewriter and uh, uh, published in the 1960s by an, at that time, expert at the museum called Karl Berger. But let's have a look at the Zubas from, uh, from this collection, because even though it was maybe obviously that when uh, the museum received the Halberstadt collection, this collection somehow just, just, uh, was forgotten somehow. It wasn't that important because the Halberstadt collection really is second uh, to none. But uh, I think it still has uh, also historical, uh, very important uh, uh, meaning for the museum. So let's have a look here. We have, uh, for instance, here this envelope, number six. And uh, part of the Tsubas in this collection, they have their own special manufactured little uh, like uh, little bags in uh, textile and here we have a beautiful a beautiful super it's round as they always are it's made of iron and it's the uh, open work design we have uh, which is very common for the tsubas and uh, here we have um, the so-called kiri tree, which is a very Japanese uh, tree uh, with uh, stylized uh, leaves and uh, flowers. And it's also part of this following, let me have it here, where we have it in a even more ornamental matter, manner, where we have uh, like 12 kiri weapon in this circular uh, movement, also within the 
open work design. And let's have a look at another one. Here we go to this number 114. So what we here see is also the natural motifs and we have the leaves from the bamboo and we have different kinds of uh, uh, floral uh, motifs and also a fine example of the open work design. And the nice relief work where we have this three-dimensional appearance. I want to show an example with gold. We have uh, the combination of the iron and then we have the uh, pine tree and we have the sky appearing. Here it's, uh, it's uh, co go uh, covered with gold and we have uh, the name of the master and we can see here in the Halperstadt manuscript and notes, we have the Japanese letter for the master and also once again where was it bored and at what time this was acquired in 1892. Thank you so much for joining me on this uh, virtual tour through our wonderful sword uh, guard collection or rather not uh, an extended tour for that, you have to come to Denmark and visit the museum and see the sword guards and fittings. Uh, I will end by uh, saying that uh, we still have these close relationship between Japan and Denmark, also when it comes to design and craft. There are so many uh, mutual interests and so much kinship between the two countries, which is very interesting so that we also today in the 21st century witness a lot of exchange and dialogue between Japanese and Danish designers, artists and craftsmen. So uh, I also hope that this uh, glimpse into a wonderful historic collection can uh, support and sustain this contemporary relation. Thank you so much. Denmark and Japan has enjoyed diplomatic relations for more than 150 years. We celebrated that back in 2017. This collection of brims is outstanding. It shows that there has been a civil to civil uh, interest uh, between Denmark and Japan for almost as many years as the diplomatic relations. Uh, the collection was started uh, in the 19th century and goes forward. Uh, and it's really uh, one of the great examples of strong ties between Denmark and Japan. It ties uh, the things that we cherish craftsmanship and design together in a very strong way. I hope you'll enjoy this video that explains more about the exhibition.